Welcome to the Evolution 2.0 podcast, where we explore the intersection of art, technology, business, biology, and spirituality. Here, you'll discover new trends in evolution that are changing the way we think about everything. This is your host, Perry Marshall, author of Evolution 2.0, 8020 Sales and Marketing, and guides to Ethernet, Google, and Facebook. I'm founder of the Evolution 2.0 Prize, a quest for the missing link between Earth science, the information age, and life itself. Let's join the conversation now. Hi, you're about to hear an interview that Connor Habib did with Lynn Margulis. Connor was not a science student, but he begged to be included in one of Lynn Margulis's classes, and she agreed, and they developed a great friendship. What you're about to hear is a first-person experience of Lynn's feisty, renegade posture and her unsuppressible spirit and um, the brilliance of her ideas. And she really did um, turn the evolution world upside down. Now, the irony is that the Russians had figured out most of symbiogenesis by the 1920s. But because of the drama in the Soviet Union and because of the chasm between the two cultures, uh, most of that was almost lost and it was largely unknown in the West. And Lynn popularized it. And it very much went against the standard orthodoxy. So she had a lot of resistance to overcome, but she did overcome it. So you're going to really enjoy this interview. And uh, remember that Evolution 2.0 is on Audible. Uh, There's a few chapters of it in the podcast feed at the beginning of uh, our series of podcasts that we have on Evolution 2.0. And so you can hear some good samples of it. And uh, make sure that you rate us on your favorite podcast service and enjoy this interview between Connor and Lynn Margulis, the last interview she ever gave. What is the purpose of life? There are three purposes. One is to live well, and the other is to live better, <laughs> best. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the purpose of life is. It's very simple. I love him. So oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I've become a Whiteheadian philosopher. So we'll, let's just get right in to this all (laughs) um so you know the reoccurring theme in your work is symbiosis and that's either you know symbioses between bacteria to form complex multicellular beings or even a reader could interpret some of your popular science work as being as expressing a symbiosis between a sort of biogeochemical symbiosis between bacteria and their environment i would reject that go ahead (laughs) And um, in addition, you're also a critic of the neo-Darwinian theory that natural selection and the accumulation of random genetic mutations leads to speciation or the appearance of new species. So can you talk about how your work in symbiosis has led you to some of these criticisms? Of my criticisms against them, I want to make this really clear. Symbiosis is a process that's always between organisms of different species. Always. So you don't have a symbiosis, symbiotic relationship with your father, even if he's still paying your bills, etc. You have an incredible symbiosis with the microbiome. It's something like 2,500 different kinds of bacteria regularly associated with the human body. And and you have it with the eyelash mites, these little mites that live in your eyelashes, even if you took a shower and so on. Those are symbioses. They're an ecological process, and they're defined as a relationship between organisms of different kinds, differently named as originally, but different kinds, that are in physical association with each other for at least half or more of the life history of at least one of them. So symbiosis is completely a physical contact kind of ecological relationship. Pollen ecology, where the bees pollinate the flowers, that's ecology, and that is an association, and it's a physical association, but it doesn't count as a symbiosis because it's much less of life history of both of the partners. So it has to be a physical long-term association. Symbiogenesis is the evolutionary process. Symbiosis is an ecological thing, but with time, it becomes symbiogenesis. Symbiogenesis is when you can have a partnership, at least a partnership, at least two different kinds of organisms, of different kinds, of or- different species, different kinds. And you can see the emergence of some phenomenon of selective advantage. In other words, you can see why 
the partnership persists under the same conditions where the individuals that are not associated will not survive, for example. And the most famous of all symbioses are the lichens. There's always a photobiont, one that produces the food and energy for the other. And there's always a mycobiont, that means a fungus of some kind. And why is that such a famous one? Because you can't study one without the other, because their sizes are so different. The cow is an incredible symbiosis, but you just don't, when you look at the cow, you don't see the, the ciliates and the bacteria and the fungi and the yeast and all that in their, room, in their rumen. You just don't see that. So all botanists who ever studied fungi run into lichens, and all lichens are products of symbiosis, so we're all schwendenerists. But the point is, what is the emergent property? It's fascinating that fungi are essentially desiccation resistant and they're basically terrestrial organisms. Whereas the algal component, the so-called phycobiont, all we know is that it's a photosynthetic organism, is an aquatic organism. And the lichen, where are they? They're in shorelines. They're in alternate dry, wet conditions. So under these alternate dry, wet conditions, the lichen survives and propagates I'll tell you about the propagation in a second. But they survive and propagate under conditions where neither of the unassociated partners would survive at all. So if, if you take a lichen and you put it in total darkness under uh, and dry it out, for example, in many of them, the, the fungus will just crawl out. Hmm. And if you keep them in total continuous light under wet conditions in some of them, the algal component will just say goodbye. I mean, it's, condition it's always conditional. And, but the lichen has, well, it has what they call ceridia. What are they? They're little bits of the fungus, which is thready. It forms a little ball around the algae, and they, it's a propagule, and they always propagate together. And some of them, they come on soil, and the soil's wet, and the, it won't start to grow. The fungus will not start to grow until it has the proper wet, dry, light, dark cycles. So that, there's a very good example. I mean, nobody argues that Schwendener is wrong. Schwendener had the audacity in the 19th century to say that they weren't plants. What do you mean they weren't plants? I mean, they look like plants, they act like plants. But lichens are not plants at all, not in any way. Plants are defined in a completely different way. All lichens have at least these two kind of partners, and most of them have a third and fourth partner too, but they have these partners. Anyway, there are about 150,000 of them, some incredible number. But all of them, if you go along the seashore or any other place, tree holes, if you, trees, it's very common, the bark of trees, are rocks that, that have any kind of little crevices in them. What's characteristic of all those habitats? Survival under these alternating conditions of wet, dry, light, dark. That's symbiogenesis, when you see new features. Now, the Darwin business. Darwin was not a neo-Darwinist. Of course, that would be anachronistic. <laughs> but he wasn't anywhere near a neo-Darwinist. He was, he was, in fact, a geologist. And he's much more of a geologist than he was a biologist. He went, yeah, anyway, he studied, for example, volcanism, lagoons, coral reefs, and so on. Darwin's main points which are indisputable, and nobody who studies any life sciences disagrees. That all, his example was elephants, and he showed that how, how the world would be covered, the earth would be covered in so many years with the progeny of a single pair, that's his mm -hmm. But there's this, I think Nietzsche might have called it the will to power, but the point is that there's this unstoppable tendency of all life forms under all conditions, slow or fast, to produce more offspring than can be supported by their immediate environment. This is everywhere. Uh, bacteria may divide in 15 minutes, and elephants may take two years of gestation. But on the geological time scale, that's all instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So the tendency of organisms to, to grow at rates that are unsustainable because you can't, there's not enough food and energy flow, they're not the resources, they will tend to overgrow their situation, all of them, under all circumstances. Now, since they don't overgrow their circumstances, I mean, they don't overgrow their, their environmental conditions, only some of them persist and reproduce, there's this, what you call now, selection pressure for only certain of them. 
under those conditions and those times and those places to leave offspring relative to their close associates and conspecifics, members of the same species, not to leave offspring. So there's only a select few that leave offspring that then in the next generation leave offspring. That's natural selection. That, that's all natural selection is. You know, if you keep flooding the environment, the fungus by itself is going to grow, grow outgrow, and it's, there's natural selection for the fungus in that place in that time, and therefore we're going to have, uh, we're going to disassociate the symbiosis. Anyway, the issue with neo-Darwinists, I mean, that part everybody agrees. Mm-hmm. The issue with neo-Darwinists is what their claims were the sources of variation and novelty. How did you get new features? How did you, because they called it from the beginning mutations. Darwin didn't call it mutations, he called it sport. Because he was pigeon fancier and he had a lot of all, all sorts of animals and plants and mm-hmm. in his life. And he would see that occasionally you'd get a sport that, that is an offspring organism that really differed from its parents and differed from its siblings and differed. That was a sport, later it would be called a mutation. In other words, it's, of course, it doesn't count, and Darwin said that very clearly, too. If that offspring that's changed, that's different, doesn't itself give rise to offspring that are different. In other words, of all the variation, it's the inherited variation that's important to us. That's the way Darwin put it. The inherited variation that was persisted over generations in seeds and frogs and whatever he was looking at. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so at the beginning of the 20th century, and I mean, by the time... I mean, Darwin died at the end, of course, I think 1888 or 1882, I never can remember, but at the end of the 1880s, the end of the 19th century. And he did receive Mendel's paper, but he couldn't read German and he couldn't understand it anyway, and a lot of people, nobody could understand it. But in the beginning of the 20th century, three different people in three different environments, some bot, one botanist, the other not, rediscovered Mendel's rules mm-hmm. and Mendel's rules and then they reconstructed Mendel because Mendel was an abbot. Mm-hmm. He was connect- he wrote to the Pope. In the session that Darwin Darwin and Wallace talked back to back, Darwin was not there because his daughter had just died and Wallace was in Indonesia. But the people had received these papers at the Linnaean Society and at that session, exactly that session, all other papers, five or six of them, were on the fixity of species made by God. Mm-hmm. One man withdrew his paper because he said he'd read the, when the Wallace stuff, withdrew it when it was coming t- time to publish. It was a terrible July afternoon and <laughs> nobody was there anyway. <laughs> and, and in fact, the notes of the 1858, when the session was, the 1858 session of the Linnaean Society, were that nothing important happened this year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when you read the titles of the papers, it's all the glory of God through fixity of species made 6,000, you know, just totally Christian right. stuff. Okay. Darwin was saying, and he said it's almost like committing a murder, that there were changes in species through time. Mm-hmm. He had lots of reasons. He was in the Andes and he saw organism, and marine organisms, marine shells, a whole environment of marine ecology up there in the carbonate rocks of the Andes. He said it must have been seashore. I mean, it's very logical. In fact, he, in the Voyage of the Beagle, he talks about microbial mats. He says that the workers on the, it's the coast of Brazil, I think, northeast Brazil, he said these people are working with this colored sand, soil, regolith, we'd call it, you know, dirt, whatever. And they call it the Madre de Sal, the mother of salt, and the Padre de Sal, because there's a green layer and a brown layer and all these mm-hmm. layers, and the people are collecting the salt from the evaporators. And he says he wonders about if there's not a whole lot of life we can't see because it's too small. I mean, he, he really did. He mm-hmm. describes a microbial mat very well. So he knows that things have changed. He can't explain any. The idea that things have changed in this place, in this time, are very clear to him. And when he says that it's that species must have changed through time, he actually writes in a letter, it's like admitting a murder, hmm. because it's so much against what everybody around him thinks. You know, Mendel 
was hearing these things. And by 1859, the book was out, it was sold well. Everybody's talking about it. In the 1860s, Mendel, you know, is, you have this image that's in the textbooks of Mendel being a monk in a backwater place called Brno. Well, I mean, that was a direct, it was not that small a place. And he was the abbot. And he was, I mean, in fact, he got so busy that he couldn't do the breeding experiments. And his breeding experiments were, were just very clear. And I like to use um, colored flowers instead of what he did because it's easier to understand. Mm -hmm. He took the red flower and the white flower. And these are flowers that had bred true. The red gave rise to red and the white gave rise to white every season. And he, he hybridized them. He took the male of one and the female of the other and he made a cross. And the first generation... All the offspring were red. And so he crossed among the red ones in the next, for the next second generation, they all the F2 generation. And there would be three red ones. Well, he did the ratios, which is a great innovation. But the point is he got the white flower was just as white as the original grandparent. Mm -hmm. There was no change at all. And there was no pink. There were the three to one ratio of the reds to the whites. And Mendel said... Don't tell me about evolution. I mean, yes, there's mixing, and yes, breeding will bring into new traits. But it's basically a mixture. It's a mixture of something constant, and the constant factor, and that was the thing that got later mm -hmm. called a gene. So by the beginning of the 20th century... But let me, just, yeah, let me um, just ask about the traits that Mendel studied, right? Yes. Because you're talking about the flowers. but That's all he did was plants. But he also studied, um, it was seed length, right? Um, well, that, tall plants and short ones. Right. And so while the flower color that you're talking about seems extremely distinct, these other traits that he studied seem a he, little he, less distinct. He, no, he didn't. No, they're completely distinct because if they weren't distinct, he wouldn't study them. Mm -hmm. And he got a total of seven, and it turns out in retrospect, the eighth one was linked to the others because there's seven chromosomes. So, mm -hmm. no, no, no. He, I'll tell you what they were. I've seen them. I've seen the plants because when the Portuguese in 2009 in Lisbon, they did a wonderful museum exhibit on Darwin. I've got a gorgeous picture I can lend it to you <laughs> of Darwin by Day Ness. Day Ness is the person who does Homo erectus for the museum. She did young Darwin looking at one of his favorite insects on his wrist anyway, for this <laughs> life, I mean, life size. And in that exhibit, the guy, his name is, oh, Jose, I know his name, but anyway, the head of this thing was a professor at the University of Biology and very nice, and he actually was at UMass with Peter Hepworth. This guy went and arranged with his Czech colleagues to get the exact plants, I mean, descendants of the plants. Mm -hmm. You have wrinkled and smooth seeds, and they're either wrinkled or they're smooth mm -hmm. in the pods. It's basically pea pods, sweet peas. So you have, I don't know if I can name all seven of them, but let me just tell you. Wrinkled, smooth, green, yellow, very clear, green or yellow, tall, short plants. And in, it's true that height often is... Meristic and not mer metric. I don't know if you know the difference, but metric is like, like not. Meristic is like five fingers. Mm -hmm. It's either five or six or four. It, in other words, it's countable and it's very clear. Whereas metric can be just lots of numbers in between. They're not integers. But in these plants, these pea plants, there's tall and tall breeds true. They're short and short beats true. And when you cross them, you get all tall in the first generation, and you get mm -hmm. three to one ratios in the second generation of tall to short. That's why we call tall dominant. Okay. The point is that these traits behaved in perfect Mendelian fashion. And when he got to eight, he stopped <laughs> because there was a problem. But so we have, anyway, it's that kind of thing. These are very distinct and it, you might as well have pink flowers. Okay. And, and, pink and, flowers these traits, and these traits, I just want to be clear about this. These traits are traits that are not, do not vary from environment to environment. With That's right. Types. That's so right. soil, sun, that's right. water, that's right. that's does not what, change That was the beautiful. That's why that's Mendel's genius. Okay. I mean, of course, probably with more soil and more nutrients and more water, there were still tall and short ones, and they were all taller, you know, something. I mean, they're, 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 it's not that they're not dependent on the environment. They are, but he kept the environment. You can really keep the environment constant so that you're only looking at the genetics. So it's his controlled environment, basically. Yes. Because yeah. with any plant, I mean, you can see for with a dandelion, for example, I mean, the size can be a huge difference depending yeah, on the Yeah, but this is stuff, 
I mean, these were picks. They were chosen of all. And that's the whole thing about all Mendelian genetics. And that's all the thing about the concept of genes, mm -hmm. that these things are picked because they are strictly inherited mm -hmm. according to Mendelian rules. That's why you've got Mendelian rules. Mm -hmm. But that allows you to infer that there's some factor that's intrinsic. And if you do a cross between people, what's your blood type? Oh. Minus two. Yeah. O cross O only gives you O, period. There's no other choice. Yeah. Whereas A and B can give you lots of things for lots of reasons. But this is, you're not, no, no matter what you eat, no matter how bad you are to yourself, <laughs> or what you do with your blood and the rest of your body fluids, you're still not going to change your blood type because that, those, are simple, those are simple Mendelian inheritance rules. Mm. So here we are with the inheritance rules being expended to a lot of different mm -hmm. organisms. In fact, Barry Catherine Bateson's grandfather, William Bateson, mm. was very active in this and was responsible for, I think, the, the idea of genes and dominance and so on of expressing it. Anyway. But we don't have anything yet about speciation. Oh, no, that's right. right. That's right. So I'm going to get to the problem, right. the way I see it. So you move to the, of course, all of genetics and evolution has always been extremely English. And it's not Anglophone. I mean... What do you mean by that? I mean, it's a French, for example, have never accepted straight Darwinism because they've always had... If you go to the Rue Buffon and you go to the Musée d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris, and right along the corner, there's Le Premier Evolutionniste, and it's Lamarck. Mm -hmm. And it's true. It's Lamarck, that is a scholar who wrote books and so on. Erasmus Darwin was also an evolutionist, mm -hmm. his grandfather. But the point is the French have always had room for more than Mendelian genetics. I'm listening to James Watson's book called The Secret of Life DNA. I'm, I'm reading it basically. It is so remarkable to me. Why? Because he's completely right on everything he says, and he says it very clearly about Mendelian genetics and how it becomes molecular genetics and so on. But the only way you succeed in any kind of contribution is to ignore everything that's not directly relevant, and that's exactly what, what mm -hmm. Mendel did. So let's look at evolution. Mendel is saying, don't tell me that there's any change through time. It's a mixing phenomenon that the um, grandfather-parent generation comes out just whatever trait it was, it comes out unblemished, that trait. Then we have Darwin who's telling us, no, there were clearly changes through time, and they're clearly, and he calls it origin of species. It's the only thing he didn't talk about at all. <laughs> but he does. There are clearly changes of the, in the fossil record and in the, in the breeders with so-called artificial selection, which is the same thing. It's natural selection. He saw these pigeons being bred. He saw the dogs being bred. Look at the dogs. They're all the same species. You can always get an offspring. I mean, But that's the, actually a contention. So you were recently awarded the Darwin Wallace... Uh, metal, right? Yeah. So that was actually a contentious point between Wallace and Darwin. And Wallace said that the dog breeding, particularly, was unnatural, completely unnatural, and everything that would make a species change would have nothing to do with dog breeding, which implied complete intentionality, complete control, well, and conditions that would never happen. Well, in my answer to that is that intentionality is with the earliest cells, and that that's just a species in very English sort of way of looking at things. That's what I would say about. About intentionality. There's domestication and farming, absolutely, in ants. <laughs> you know, in other words, this idea that it's only in people or it's only because people, it's. Anyway, anyone with their eyes open see that there's changes through time, and, mm -hmm. and you see even relatively short amounts of time. So, what did they do? These this smart asses. That, I would really say that they're from the high table, and I've been there, I know, <laughs> from the uh, senior common room, the senior fellows of, I think it was mostly Cambridge, but it's probably Oxford too. The R.A. Fisher, who is a mathematician, and he's using the grand activity of algebra. I mean, it's totally simple minded, is what he did. And, he, and it's not just Fisher, but it's Sewell Wright and the founders of the neo-Darwinist ideas, starting in England, first of all, they're only studying what interests them. 
mammals and people. So they have mating systems. You don't have any offspring that are not products of, of a single parent, which is if you study most of life, you do have single parent offspring all the time. So they're talking about mating systems. It's, in my opinion, it's fundamentally a, a rationalization. They called things that were changed in a heritable way mutants. Mm -hmm. So they made up an algebra that said all genes have two alternatives, tall, short, yellow, uh, green, and they used a capital Y for yellow, actually for green, the one that's most prevalent, and small Y for yellow. They were pairs. They called those pairs alleles. And they made up an arithmetic that says there are changes, that Mendel is right. He, is, he was right. Mendel is right. These things are assorted. But what would involve and these things, these factors, changing through time? And there's seven or eight th things. One is you get a new mutation. So the mutation rate would be yellow to green and green to yellow, those are the only way, you know, going in both directions equally, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. We don't know what it is, but it's a mutation. So one is you get new mutations, and they're at random with respect to selection. Well, they are, in a way. Yellow and green, the new sport is not directed by its presence, so, because it will take that as, a, these are all axia. Is that right? Ax, no, axioms? What's the plural of axiom? With an S? I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, these are axioms. <laughs> that you could change a gene. That, first of all, you get the idea that Bendel's factors is determined by genes, and you get this brilliant insight that the only thing in, this, in biology that acts the way Mendel's factors do are chromosomes, which is a whole other story. But let's just take the genetics aspect of it. You have new mutations appearing. Yeah, it's true. You have breeding systems where some of the organisms breed more frequently so you have changes in the breeding system such that the ones that breed more frequently would leave more of their offspring or with each other more the assorted versus disassorted in other words ones that are alike will tend to breed alike and leave more of their own you have immigration and emigration you have the movement in a population of the organisms whatever they are in and out of that population you can have a bottleneck where they, they're a founder's effect where the island is populated by the genes that it's populated with. So you have about seven things like this that were given as what would change the genes through time because we have to admit that both of them are right, that Mendel is right that about the factors and that Darwin is right about change through time. And they made up, it's all made up, it's all made up. I mean, I, you have to laugh when you think that that the genes are going to be equally going in each direction. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, there's already, I mean, it already seems built up on this idea, which I don't know if you would say that this is made up, but this idea that all traits have some sort of polarity in expression, right? Yeah, like, well, not polarity. Tall, no, they're but, dichotomous, yes. Okay. The so, ones he studied were all dichotomous. Right, but then they extrapolated from that that all traits were somehow represented that way. Yeah, oh yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And the way genetics is taught is because when they did have that tra that ability, that feature, you can predict things. Right. But when they didn't, it's messy, you know. Right. So what happened when I was a student, if you ask what is evolution, and you weren't in a paleontology department or ge geology department, we were taught and we had to write down that evolution is the change of gene frequencies in natural populations change in gene frequency in natural populations through time. Mm -hmm. So what was the f gene frequency? You have these dichotomous, you know, big A, little a, and you measured how many had, you, you had to have at least two represented, you can't study Mendelism if everything is, if all organisms are the same for all the traits that you're studying, you can't study them. And that's why in that, that homage to Gaia, Dawkins kept saying, well, what's only important is the differences. I mean, that's what he's talking about. Homage to Darwin, and the other, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The other thing is they started to fool with the environment and they found that mutations were augmented by x-rays and certain chemicals. Mm -hmm. So that was another, 
the mutations themselves could change. So what they did is they listed all the things that could change in principle, and they insisted that that's what would explain everything. Mm -hmm. And one of the, to me, the most egregious, besides the dichotomy that this is the possible trait and that's the other possible trait and that's it, which is egregious and completely wrong, but it's not completely wrong. It's a, it applies to seven out of thousands of right. traits in Mendel's piece. But the other thing is the idea when they idealized the factors as big Y, little Y, like mm -hmm. you said, that there was something intrinsic that determined that you could study, for example, to make it really clear, the three to one ratio is coming from the, the one that's infrequent, the so-called recessive, like the um, yellow piece instead of the green ones. And I've got a better one. I, I, that's why I like the white one rather than the pink one, because it's very clear. The white ones crossed amongst themselves, never gave anything but white flowers. Mm -hmm. But the red ones gave two kinds, ones that bred true for red and twice as many that also gave rise to white. And from this we deduced that there were two factors in every organism, and this was completely right. So you've got this great predictability that you never had anywhere in science at all. So the concept was that this is not just right, but enough. And the assumption I'm getting at that is egregious is that if you have the factor, one copy or two copies of the factor, that factor entirely determines the phenotype or what you see. In other words, there are no mm -hmm. issues with genotype-phenotype relationship because if you have the gene, it may be different if you have one copy or an alternate gene or two copies. But it follows 100% from that what you're going to look like, whether you're red or white. Mm -hmm. This ignores a field that's going crazy today called genotype-phenotype relations. I don't know what it's called, epigenetics and stuff. So it's the epitome of reductionism, this mm -hmm. kind of view. And it just happens to be wrong for most things. And also, I mean, it raises a question for me when you say it's reductionism into these seven traits that can be determined as dichotomous and also what you've just said. I don't really understand how natural selection could only work on one trait at, to produce one trait at a time. That's, that's an assumption. That's it's confusing. one of their, their very bad assumptions. How could it not... How, it how has the, to work on an organism. So, right. and A whole organism. And, and, in fact, an organism in groups, too, and they deny that. It's too. funny, because when you said populations before, I thought to myself, do they even say populations anymore? Is the word populations even used? Like, oh, yeah. Because you're responding oh, to the yeah. answer, because everything's just been brought down into this level of the gene. No, they sprung off with a group which I find it very technical, called population genetics, mm. which is, oh, it's done some things about reconstructing the history of migration and people and stuff like that. And maybe detection of diseases too. But that assumption in the population genetics is that the members of the population are individual and they have no influence on each other. That's the first thing that's obviously <laughs> crazy. So what they have is a... A religion there. It really is. What is a religion? A religion is something that you believe without any evidence. Right? You take on faith. And they've drummed this into people. they just drummed this into people. And so that you've got a Jerry Coyne type reaction to people who are brought up with this. So the only way speciation can work is to have genes that are relevant to the speciation process. Well, you do. You have genes that are relevant to the fact that they don't breed. And to mammologists... Speciation means members of the same species now become reproductively isolated because the breeding doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So it's taking processes that are incredibly complex and forcing them into this Procrustean bed mm -hmm. of yes-no dichotomy of this gene for this and a gene for that. There's right. no gene for anything anyway. So, so this is what the summary is very simple. I was just a curious student asking all the time, give me any example. I don't care if it's in the field, in the laboratory, in cages, you know, in, or in uh, the fossil record. Mm -hmm. I want one case 
where one you could actually document the passage from one species to another. And it was very interesting. The, the best work is the Galapagos finches. That's true. They've done every year for 30 years. These people are wonderful scientists. Mm -hmm. They climb up this volcanic, this, by these people, I mean, Rosemary and Peter Grant from Princeton, or really from England. And they have seen definitely natural selection. They've seen that when there was a very droughty year and, the, and there was not good sun, the, the trees that made very big seeds didn't have any offspring, and the birds that were dependent on the big seeds with the big nutcrackers, they actually went extinct on Daphne Island. So yes, they've seen extinctions, they've seen big changes, big rainfall, lots of little seeds, They've seen big changes in the populations and unto extinction. But of course, they've never seen speciation. Right. They don't know what it is. I mean, they, they, and I only buy speciation when the naturalist tells you that this is one species and the next one is another species. I mean, right. I, I don't expect. Which is really funny because when I listened to your talk at Oxford and you were there with Dawkins <laughs> and you were there with two others, right? Yeah. And when you said this, <laughs> Something similar to this, they began to, someone started to say, well, what are the naturalists saying? As if what the naturalists had said to identify what was a species and what wasn't was now suddenly invalid in the face of this. So that aspect had to be thrown out too. But beyond that, I mean, when you, <laughs> it was really funny to me because what you're showing them as doing is something that they constantly accuse you of doing. Which so let me, let me sort of back up a little bit and say so when you brought up examples right about instances of symbiosis because symbiogenesis you, yes of symbiogenesis when you say show me examples and they say well why don't you show us examples right so then you say okay well there are these slugs that have at some point formed a permanent symbiosis with i'm not sure what the exact order the diatom okay and with the of the green alga, and with nothing. Right. So, so three different species in the same genus. They're all totally related to Right. So you show this clear example of an instance where it must have happened. Yeah. Right? And then <laughs> you also say, well, there are many examples, right? So first they jumped on you as saying that you were extrapolating everything from that one example. But of course there are many examples. First they asked you for an example. Then you then gave one, an and then anecdote. they said you were a general. Then they said yeah. it's an anecdote. Well, exactly. So then Richard Dawkins says, we don't want another anecdote, right, yes. as you're about to present more evidence, and then goes on to tell a story using an analogy of fire and one flame jumping to another thing. And I thought, well, what kind of anecdote are we looking for here? What you've presented is evidence. It's biology. And then there's an analogic, like, anecdote, right, which yes. is what Dawkins presented. And so it seems like that neo-Darwinism is filled with anecdotes, but has sort of a scarcity of actual evidence. So then <laughs> the response people give is, so why would you want to have a whole new theory when natural selection with... Is sufficient. Uh, yeah, it's sufficient. And you say, well, look at the evidence. And then they say, well, those are special and rare examples. And you say, here are more. And then they say, we don't want another anecdote. So there's an eventual point where they literally just will not listen. They don't want to hear it at all. And they don't want to look at it. So they have a really consistent, what seems to be a very consistent theory, but not physical evidence. So what is wrong? Why are they not accepting your evidence, which is observable, which has been seen, and at least very strongly inferred by things that have been seen in the Absolutely. lab and outside it's the lab in nature. It's been seen in the lab with Kong Jia, yes. but it's not even, it doesn't count because it's not mammals and it's not sexual. Right, and that's what they constantly say is, well, this is a special exception, yeah. right? So what do you think's happening well, me, with that? Me, What's their resistance? It's so interesting. Niles Eldridge was always interested in fossils, and he could see that there's a lot of different fossils in the fossil record. And so he went to the Bahamas or East Africa, I can't remember. He's really good at trial bites. And what he saw was the same thing that people in the Daphne Island are seeing. They're seeing variation within the species. And it's quite significant, but it's always variation within a range that's measurable. And then, boom, next stratum, a new species. Mm -hmm. And they call that, I'm not sure the word, the word is good, punctuated equilibrium. But the discontinuity aspect of the fossil record, I've always felt, is much more consistent with symbiogenesis than it is with the gradual accumulation of random mutations. Mm -hmm. So what is the answer? It's why do people who are sincere and wonderful Catholics believe the three equals one? 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because their parents were that way, because they have been taught that way, because it represents a security. I mean, it's got to do with people's, in the academic world, it's worse. And Fleck, you've you read, I think. Fleck, have you read Fleck? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's fantastic. Fleck wrote the book. He was very young when he saw this phenomenon. The Genesis and Development of Scientific Fact. Mm-hmm. Kuhn read it. Mm-hmm. It was written in German. Mm-hmm. Its English translation is really good. It's one of the great sociologists did it. Anyway, what did he say? He said when fields are really close to each other, that's where the, the block is the strongest. In other words, mm-hmm. people in the same academic field with a name Biochemists became molecular biologists. Natural historians became paleontologists or geneticists, right? They changed the name. The name refers to the thought collective. And the people in the thought collective have the same Deccan style, the same style of thinking. And when they reject papers and they reject concepts like this, they're rejecting because they can't understand it, because it doesn't fit their thought style. They can't even look at a paper and review it that doesn't fit their own thought style. So this is a phenomenon, it can be in religion, it can be sports, it can be in anything. It's in anything. It's it's in anything. And that's the real problem. They belong to a different thought style. So, but then, you know, you have this problem of science and many scientists claiming science to be sort of clean of this issue. Yeah, well, they're delusionary. So how do you keep it clean? I mean, how do you... Well, there's this concept that almost all scientists have that there really is an objective reality. But there's no evidence whatsoever because everything observed is through an observer and that observer tends to be a person. Mm-hmm. And therefore it's colored by the historical and familial and all these things. And there's really discontinuities. And it's so amusing to me that the most obvious and crazy case in all of biology, I have a, a little swimming alga. It's photos of Ochromonas. A little swimming algae, very pretty, you can always tell what it is. Ochromonas danica. Everybody agrees it was 16th, 17th century named by competent people. The botanists will tell you that it's in the plant kingdom. And the zoologists will tell you in the animal kingdom. So that's, that's the first thing. The botanists will call it <laughs> chrysophyte, which stands for golden yellow because that's the color. And the Zoologists will tell you that it's phytomastigophora, which means a plant like that swims. Mastigophora means with a tail. And we go on to every level of classification, from kingdom to phylum to class to genus to species. <laughs> and when we get to the genus to the species, it's the same organism. Mm-hmm. But the botanists are phycologists or algologists or lower plant experts. And they are analyzing according to their scheme. And the zoologists are called them protozoa, the lower animals. And how do they maintain this level of... I mean, can you imagine a corn plant being both in the animal and the plant kingdom? <laughs> if they could see the organism, really. It's, it's, how do they manage this? By not going to the same meetings, by, not, by having different journals, and by keeping their thought styles separate. So everything you could say in science is that way. So that was actually one of... It's something that... Goethe expressed very often. He has a great essay about the subject and object in science. And he says, you know, we have to work, as we observe phenomena, first we have to understand that it's, we're interacting with it. Of course. But we're also interacting with our thoughts. So the first thing that we need to do is think about our thinking as we're thinking about the thing we're approaching. And suddenly all sorts of things will pop up. That doesn't mean that those don't relate to our object of study. In fact, those there things can no reveal something study. very... Yeah, but there is no objectivity, real objectivity. There's no such thing. Well, his idea was that if we begin to think about the thinking and see everything that starts to pop up on our emotive response and everything... Yes, and not pretend that it's not there, first yeah, of all, which the is the, the, the biggest problem. Not to sever ourselves from that. We'll learn something about whatever it is we're studying, but then also conclusions will begin to arise on their own and we'll be able to distinguish them from our normal thoughts in a certain way. Well, from our, so, our prejudice going in because you have this... Pre- but I want to ask you, does, does Steiner study Goethe especially? Yes. Okay. Yeah, in fact, almost... 
That was, that was his first big break, and his first sort of break in science was he was asked to edit and repress all of Goethe's scientific studies and write essays on them. What do you mean repress them? Um, well, they were, he had a journal that he was working on, and he was writing on them. He was asked to edit and What's present. What's repress mean, though, in that? Is that a word for that? Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. Not repress. Republish, I should say. Oh, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Repress, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So anyway, there's a huge influence of Goethe's biological thinking on Steiner. Yeah, it's it's in in fact when I went to the Nature Institute in, in New York, which is a Goethe and Science Institute, yeah. I had no idea that I was getting into Steiner, but of course But you knew you were getting into Goethe, but exactly, you read Goethe. Goethe. Yeah, but Steiner was just all over it, right? So yeah. that's and that's a tenet of anthroposophy, which is that we must think about our own thinking as we're trying to apprehend yeah, sure. the what we call the external world. Well I think there's a statement in, in the function of reason that book by it's uh, by Whitehead, and it's really, it's really not about the function of reason. It's really about they talk about he talks about it. There's this statement that says non-human animals are claimed not to have purpose to, to act at random. And he said, I think that those who claim that non-human animals don't have purpose need to be studied. <laughs> for their complete ignorance of what's going on around, denial of, you know. He mm -hmm. said, they're so peculiar in that belief for which there's no evidence at all. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, uh, which uh, it's one of the things I like very much about that book. It's very blunt. Yeah. yeah. But that's another sort of symptom of trying to make things um, enemies where we could just merely make a distinction. What's the distinction in purpose between non-human animals and human yeah. animals rather than simply saying one has purpose and the well, other doesn't? It, Lovelock thinks that dichotomization, which is so intrinsic to people's way of doing things, that it really comes from being threatened by the environment to know you have a plant there, you have a mushroom there, you have a, a fierce animal there, to know whether it's edible, it's going to eat you, whether you have to run, whether you can take it home for dinner. You mm -hmm. have to know these things. You have to know your natural environment or you're not going to live. And mm -hmm. so you've got to make snap, snap judgments based on signs and symbols, and people are really good at that. But that's also, I mean, if you would explore that more, you would begin to produce a better sort of result in response to your environment. Because you would begin to, if you would think about your thinking, think yeah, about your course. response, you would create a more complex sort of matrix between yeah. the well, environment and yourself. You have and nuance, and this, this, it's platonic. The, the traditions of genetics, classical genetics, are platonic. They're not nuanced at all. They're not Goethean at all. <laughs> and what happens is people get socialized in them. Yeah. So... Anyway. It just seems so obvious to me. I mean, and it seems obvious because I had to work to make it obvious, yeah. but it seems obvious to me that this natural selection, random mutation thing just cannot be correct. And I think it's created this huge problem where not only is natural selection the only form of evolution now, natural selection, random mutation, evolution now, right? But if you disagree with that, you're also considered to be unscientific, you don't the like creationist. science, you believe 6,000 years, yeah. they've only been yeah. here for 6,000 years. Those are the two years. prices. So yeah. how did that evolution, that model of evolution, become a stand-in for all of scientific thinking? Well, okay, let me just say, again, we have to distinguish, the, it, the random mutation is the source of innovation, is, in my opinion, completely undocumented. Mm -hmm. Whereas the tendency of organisms properly associated with their environments at a given time leaving more offspring, the natural selection part right. of it is not a contention at all. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask. And I think that in the Fleck book, Robert Merton, who is, he died recently, but maybe not so recently, but he was the great sociologist who, who worked on this book with Tadeus, I can't remember who, who was the translator from German. And they have a fantastic afterword. afterward. And I think the, their analysis is completely correct. The stages are, in all scientific discovery, and all scientific work, you begin with esoterica. You begin with two guys in the lab or just one guy in nature. I mean, it, there's no science, anything. There isn't a science. And, and, and Fleck says this. There's no scientific fact. A fact has to be developed. And it's a sociological phenomenon, which he did. When he was 22 and he was a, micro, you know, he was a medical microbiologist and he saw this stuff happening. Anyway, 
So the first stage always is esoterica. And then it has to go a fact, a potential fact, and his fact was so cute. It was the Wasserman positive test for syphilis. He, that was his, that's why the book fascinated me so much, because that was his, his example. Members of the same thought style belong to the same thought collective, and you belong to it in contemporary times as a way of getting out of it also is historical because you read people in the same field that are old, the predecessors, and that's another way that you have the slightest idea what they're talking about even though they're using the same words because it's changed through time. So you get the fundamental unit is the thought style shared by the thought collective. And I can tell you, for example, what is Vagis Proskauer and Acid Fast? What are those things? <laughs> Well, that's because you don't belong to the microbiology thought right. style, okay? So, I mean, they're key words. Words become battle cries. That's what Flex said. Words become battle cries. And to see which team you're on. Which, anyway. But the commentator said, actually, Fleck had said this, but he, they said it really clearly. So all science starts as esoteric. And I'm answering your question, too. I just have to get to it. And how does it go to body make You know what body make is? No. Oh, you do. Vadi mecum, it's Latin for go, ir, va, you know, what is it in French? You know, it's go, allez, je vais, okay, <laughs> vadi, make them with me, so it goes with me. A vadi make them is basically a book or a series of social documents. For example, the Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, Berge's Manual for the Bacteria, the Bible, or the, um, in science, it's these great reference books, right, that standardize the knowledge of the field, right? It can be a big microbiology book, but that's what Vadi Makem is. Mm. To go from esoterica, which it always starts with, to Vadi Makem, what has to be done? You have to give talks. You have to influence people. You have to write articles. You have to have a lot of references. There's a whole lot of very hard activities that go from your little discovery in the laboratory, you know, of the background radiation in the universe and, and having it accepted. So the second step is always vadi makeup. It has to get into the vadi makeup. It's got to get into the dictionary. It's got to get into the glossary of geology. It's got to get into the things that the people who share the thought collective believe are true. And the problem with Jerry Coyne is his what he his body make him is completely different from mine. His, mm. his is the standard neo Darwinism, and mine is, mine is against you know something else. Mm. Anyway, but and here's the big point that the sociologists make. To me, Fleck is the only true sociology of science. Even Kuhn Kuhn said with, that he just <laughs> he said that he read Fleck for he had it out for years, mm. and he gave one great example in chemistry, but the concepts are. Are basically flex. Okay, so but flex says the body make them isn't enough to become a scientific fact. It must be there, but it's not enough. The only way a scientific fact is accepted as a fact is when it fits in to the zeitgeist, the Weltanschauung, the capitalist system in this case. Hmm. So it's the whole Darwin business is so tied to the culture at large, and when it's the science is fighting the culture at large, no way does it get accepted. That, and that, I think that's the answer. Hmm. The Darwinism with Andrew Carnegie and uh, uh, Chase Bank and the Rockefellers and the Roosevelts hmm. and the, the oligarchs and the big power is much more, that is the perverted Darwinism, hmm. is much more in tune to the cultural milieu at the time, especially when they're building all the railroads and all that. Well, that seems to me to be then good news for a stronger truth in evolution because that system seems to be really failing and falling apart. You know, and there's a lot of uh, movement toward collectivity now in a way. There is an awareness of, see, but I don't consider symbiosis like cooperation. I consider cooperation social. But you're right. Is the environment more amenable? Mm. to interaction to local products and all that stuff relative to the kind of spirit of the times that you had you know when, when neo-darwinism was at its peak but when it fits in with the bigger view that's when you have everybody jumping on the bandwagon right. and when it's the science 
against the cultural milieu, you know the cultural milieu is going to work. <laughs> so is that, and that, that's the answer to your question. Yeah. Right yeah. So there's, I mean, it's really interesting that the whole sort of cult and culture of what it means to be an individual really seems to me to be changing right now. And there are all sorts of, as you say, it's a cultural milieu, these pressures, whether it's, this idea of a cult of personality or celebrity. I mean, anybody can be a celebrity now by going on YouTube. Everybody's looking into each other's lives through Facebook, through social profiling. So everybody has this sort of uh, voyeuristic celebrity aspect to them now. You have the Occupy movement that's going on now, which was this almost spontaneous... Yeah, this almost spontaneous thing where all these people just rose up and came together and against this idea of capitalism, which was the former cultural movement. So if you have all that happening, it seems to me that the idea of what it means to be an individual is changing, and that is very deeply related to ideas of symbiosis, symbiogenesis. Absolutely. I mean, one thing, there's only one, the unit of life that is the minimal system that shows 100% of the properties of life is a bacterial cell, and you can't study it because it's one by itself you have to have a large number of them before you can see them or test their behavior Mm -hmm. so that I would say that the biggest difference between their sense the the neo-Darwinist hegemony that hegemony that has run run all the money for evolution and the things that we are saying is that the individual is exactly not that the individual is complex and composite the individual all the individuals you can see with your unaided eye all of them, without exception, are basically walking communities. They're groups. Mm-hmm. They're very integrated, some more integrated than others, but really integrated. And so the whole concept of individual is platonic. It's left over from Plato's ideas and mm-hmm. you know, platonic. Views. So do you have an idea then of a bacterium sort of switching back and forth from being an entity and a process? Because it seems that... Oh, all life is process. Yeah. All life is process all the time. And yes, you can identify an entity. But, I mean, it, it gets you to the, the basic concept of autopoiesis, which viruses don't have. And all cells have them. All cells are autopoietic entities. Some of them, for example, the Borrelia we were talking about and the, and the syphilis spirochete have four-fifths of the genes coming from you, <laughs> the one-fifth relative to their very close relatives that are living in, in uh, you know, not in a body, but in a culture medium. So, yes, individuality is relative. And I've got a chapter called that, Mm -hmm. Relative Individuality. It's not, we think of it as something fixed and clear because we as mammals, first of all, we don't have larval stages, which is a shame. That's why we can't understand (laughs) Don Williamson. We just don't have them. We also have to always stay wet on the inside. You can't have any desiccation. Mm -hmm. The problem with these people, well, I like to say that they're all these people that have dominated the evolution money Almost none are botanists. They're all basically coming in through zoology, and they're coming in through a human interest, and they're playing with one fifth of the deck. They're just they're playing games with one thing. They are automatically excluding the really interesting, uh, to me, interesting <laughs> biological modes of life by only playing. Or one. and even deeper, deeper. I think, from my perspective, is that they're excluding their ability to. Uh, or they're distancing themselves from being able to even consider things as close to objectivity as possible. Because no, if you're right. studying animals yep. and you're studying something that's very much like the human being, the condition that you're in, and you want to study human beings as well, the evidence is going to become worse and worse as you oh, get to that I can level. Tell you, I can tell you so. probably quantitatively that the closer you get to humans in your studies of prime human, you know, anthropoid, apes, and so on. The closer you get to medical significance or humans, the more distorted, the more money. I mean, it's just complete, it's, it's like the Texas view of the world. You know, everything's Texas. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's in this, I mean, you can call it corruption, you can call it inability to be objective at all, you know, whatever you want to call it. But it's so obvious, especially when there's, money flow or there's practical mm. consequences of what you're doing so that you, that's why cosmology is great I mean <laughs> nobody really cares very much because it doesn't have any immediate practical mm. significance <laughs> whereas I can't I, I well I like to say maybe you well that medical science is an oxymoron 
It's an oxymoron. Like military intelligence. It's an oxymoron. All right? It's, 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 they, you cannot be... There are certainly physicians, trained physicians like Leidy, who made great contributions, but not as physicians. They made it because they become scientists. <laughs> and I don't think you can be... The Hippocratic Oath says, I will honor the man who taught me these arts and will teach them to his son. Loyalty to the man before do no harm. I mean, it comes before do no harm. Mm-hmm. It's intrinsic to the activity, to lie, to cheat, to steal, to acquire property. And it's a shame because I, all the people aren't like that, but most of them are. I worked really hard to find a doctor who was capable of saying, I don't know, to me very Have often. Have you ever found one? Oh, yeah. He's great. Good, you got a good doctor. Yeah, and he's very... In San Francisco. Yeah, and he will also say things like, well, you know, we can go down the long, expensive, and ultimately probably ineffective path of finding out what's causing this problem, or you can just wait and see if it goes away. (laughs) I have a doctor like that, but she wanted to be a botanist. She couldn't afford it. (laughs) Well, he's an anthroposophical doctor, so... So all that said, then I wonder, you know, I've heard you say that The one thing that we need to realize, I'm not quoting you directly, but the one thing we need to realize is that there's never a single explanation or a single cause. Well, you you can never do only one thing. So I'm wondering then other models of evolution aside from symbiogenesis that are exciting to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that aspect of evolution, that is, where do you get big, important, new innovation? Mm -hmm. That's the issue. Because I'm telling you, the natural selection and the population expansion, those are things that are right. they are just universal. And what's ironic is that the real change in mammal species is coming from chromosomal phenomena. Well, you know you have Down syndrome, the, you know, Down syndrome, mm-hmm. yeah. That's just a fragment of a chromosome error. You know, mm-hmm. it can be an extra fragment or translocated fragment. So we know that very small changes in the chromosomes can have huge, mostly lethal actually, because animals, mammals are obligate diploids. They can only take two chromosomes at once. Mm-hmm. You know, plants are much more open to changes. But anyway, it's chromosome phenomenology about which we know something. And that whole idea is not anywhere in the speciation literature. Hmm. This guy, Coyne, writes a 700-page speciation book, (laughs) and it's all Drosophila genes, because he's assuming it's genes, Mm -hmm. and and human evolution. Mm -hmm. Which is, the fact that he uses Drosophila when I'm talking to you, that makes me laugh, because you've written so much about the separation of distinct Drosophila based on uh, the symbionts that they had. Well, that's... I've recently got a letter that's wonderful and finally the publication of a guy who has documented the old speciation cages of uh, Dobzhansky in the field for Drosophila of Pseudobscura and he's very happy to... I mean, he was brought up a neo-Darwinist mm-hmm. and he's I don't care, he's at the University of Vienna but I mean, finally this, he wrote me a long time ago but he actually sent me a published paper they finally got it through published paper in the Rosamala literature, but I'm saying that those people that talk about speciation, they talk about genetic differences. It turns out that there's more genetic differences. I mean, at the gene sequence DNA level, there are more genetic differences between two Bushmen than there are between anyone else in the whole world. <laughs> between any two, you pick, you pick Scandinavians <laughs> and, and Tierra del Fuegans, mm. and there are differences. And that these differences are on the individual level. And that they do not accumulate and change species at all. Hmm. So I'm not denying that there are genetic differences. I'm just saying the mutational level genetic differences are not at all the basis of speciation, hmm. whereas chromosomal phenomena like, like the karyotypic changes are. And the karyotypic changes are fantastic. And it's mammalian. And yet that, that literature has been... There's a man called Max King who wrote a fantastic book on speciations, speciation in animals mostly, and chromosomes, where he really did study it. And Robin brought him to my attention because he's Australian. And that's because a guy called M.J.D. White in the 1940s or something went to Australia. He was not upper-class English, but he wanted to be. And he wrote about the karyotypic phenomenon that 
that believe that all the chromosomes behave the same at once is believing in miracles, and we scientists don't believe in miracles, and he squashed the whole field, okay? This guy, Max King, a much younger man, was a postdoc and was a student of this in this group. At least they were interested in chromosomes and animals, speech He wrote this brilliant book, and I, we couldn't find him. I got Reg Morrison to go look for him. Finally found him. Absolutely brilliant guy. He did wrote, write me an answer. He said he quit all of science. He's, he's got a sheep farm, and he just can't answer because he has not kept up with the literature. It was fascinating while he did. And I think that's a sign of it because... What do you do if you if everyone he did what he, he said what he could and he finished what he could but it's just not people weren't thinking the way he was and so he, I mean I don't know what the reason is maybe you know maybe he has personal reasons but I know it's just a terrible shame because he know more about hmm. the speciation of animals and their and their one of the key things about working out the speciation for mammals is to do zoogeography is to take is to plot on maps. The chromosomes, and you, this is totally successful. Hmm. But, you know, Robin Scudder papers are rejected all the time. Hmm. Just like Williamson. And I, when I said, Williamson wrote, today I get this letter. My, he had suggested that I would be one of the reviewers, which they probably didn't like, but they didn't get just, that far. Just for people who are listening, Don Williamson, just give a very brief. <laughs> oh, no. Don Williamson noted something that the naturalist noticed many years ago that many animals like caterpillars to moths and what are the larvae do people know? Uh, I know. Maggots to flies have dramatic changes in every aspect of their body during their development. The younger forms are called, the first forms, the earlier forms, are called larvae. And Williamson claimed that there are two genetic systems. One for the larva and one for the adult and they're in the same egg and that they are the developmental pattern is for the young one first and then turns off and every step on his hypothesis is verified it's the breeding between two different species to produce well it wasn't even yeah that's the original situation yeah. but now there are two genomes right. in the cells an egg has two in other words animals have multiple animal ancestors the ones that right. have these what they call Metabolism that is dramatic changes in form. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this guy is 90 years old. He sent me a letter. You can calculate how long ago. I'm 68 years old. I'm from a short lived family and I'm on a straight line course for posthumous recognition. <laughs> and he, he just showed me how he's, everything he was doing was being rejected all the time. Today, he's 90 years old. And I got, and he's still kicking in. He's had a stroke because he was collecting eggs by slipping on the rocks, it's a shame. But anyway, I got this letter saying, my origin of chordate larva paper has been summarily rejected. Here are the reviewers. And they just sound like Jerry Coyne. I mean, and I wrote back immediately. And I said, Don, this paper especially will never be accepted by zoologists. You have to go way beyond zoologists to get people to look at it who can read it and it, you have to make it so that they can read it. Anyway, and I'm glad to help you. And that's what I want to do. But it's true. It's like the neo-Darwinists are never going to accept anything I do. <laughs> They've stopped all my money. I mean, they can't. It's like, I don't want to make, you know, invidious comparisons. But it's dealing with the other, the foreigner, and the same thing that causes racial and religious dissension. It's the same tribalism that's everywhere in human activity. So something that's also very different, I think, about you and uh, not all neo-Darwinists, and I think some of them are really well-spoken, thoughtful, <laughs> so I don't want to just sweep them all, you know. But, okay, so you wrote a book of short stories, Luminous Fish, and you have another book, um, Slant of Truth, which is now called Dazzle Gradually, both take their titles. Well, no, actually, and, it's, it, it's a lot of new essays in it, but oh, okay. it is the descendant. Yeah, yes. and it, it, both take their titles from Emily Dickinson. You live literally in Emily Dickinson's backyard. Oh, well, the house here has a sign saying this is National Historical Property of Emily <laughs> So, and you've also, uh, you're fond of quoting her, and you're fond of quoting other literary figures. And it seems to me that that has somehow 
given you a way to also step back and consider things in a different way. And I'm wondering where that literary sensibility and the scientific mind that you have meet. And Well, I didn't want to be, deal with people. I just wanted to read from the time I could remember <laughs> that I could read. It's true. It's a way of escaping mm. the social gossip and the nonsense that's going around you all the time. And I, I still get my great pleasures out of reading. But with respect to Emily Dickinson, I'm glad you brought it up because this interview is getting to be over. <laughs> and I want to tell you my new project. Okay. Emily, in her poem, What Mystery Pervades a Well, that water stands so far, a neighbor in another, from another world residing in a jar whose limits none have never seen but just its lid of glass. Like looking every time you please in Abyss's face, I will now miss some stanzas. The last stanza is, For nature is a stranger yet, the ones who cite her most, like us now, <laughs> have not passed her haunted house nor simplified her ghost. To pity those who know her not is helped by the regret that those who know her know her less the nearer her they get. <laughs> That's why this book which I have, I, I think it's going to go up really well. The book is called For Nature is a Stranger Yet, which is what I feel after spending all my life in nature. For Nature is a Stranger Yet, decoding Emily Dickinson. Why? Because of Hans Werner Luscher. Ever heard of him? Mm. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. He died in 1991 or something like that. He was a Swiss who spent his entire life, he started to translate Emily Dickinson into German because he lived in this, well, lived in Canada, he lived in an English-speaking country. He was very, very good in English. He was a photographer. He was a wild, took people up the mountains, a Swiss mountaineer, a tourist. He was always writing articles to go back to the Zurich or so, wherever he was from. Basel, no, he's a Basler, completely a Basler. But he became very good in both languages. So he started in the Los Angeles Public Library, had no money, reading Emily Dickinson and said, this poetry is so good, it needs to be made into German. And in the end, when he died, not a single poem had been published in German that he had done. Mm -hmm. But he spent 40 years or something like that, every night working on it, and he discovered her secret code. <laughs> it's totally sexual. Okay. This whole story is in this book. But what is fascinating is that Hans Lischer does have, he has stuff that's clearly wrong in his analysis. Mm -hmm. And of course, I only have the part of his analysis that was collected to show it to a publisher because there literally are 40 boxes mm -hmm. of stuff. But my colleague and friend who worked with Dick Wilkie, you know Dick Wilkie is, don't you? Well, he's the... Um, He's my closest colleague in the geosciences mm -hmm. department. He did the historical atlas of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, geographical distribution of stuff. And a woman who worked for him on this project, who had a master's degree in English and another master's degree in maybe education, I don't know, but she's great. Her name is Ruth Owen Jones, published in Emily Dickinson's Studies. It's called... Something, neighbor, friend, bride, or husband. Mm -hmm. She published her very sober analysis. I mean, I met her at a party for Dick Wilkie's gorgeous photographs because he, she, he should work with him. And she really knows, and I know I've been looking at it carefully for a long time, she really knows who the master figure was. You know, the ma she wrote three letters to the mm -hmm. master figure and all that. But the combination of Lusher's literary analysis and Ruth Owen Jones's published papers in Dickinson Studies that Richard what's his name now? William Smith Clark was mm -hmm. the master figure. It's correct. It's correct because there's so much evidence. Ruth has been working on it for years. I mean the evidence doesn't come from me. It comes from Ruth. So my little book is Decoding Emily Dickinson. I'm putting down the pieces and when you you learn as the reader what happened to me as I learn what was happening. I feel that it's not only a mystery story, it's solved, mm -hmm. mostly because of the gorgeous scholarship of my colleague Ruth Owen Jones. 
And Isn't that wild? Yeah, I'm excited for it. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> it's a totally new project for you. Oh too. yeah, but it, and how did I do it? I, <laughs> I was got, it's, but I did it on this, the taping, and I did it on an old fashioned tape machine. I talked into it. I talked into the story, right. and I'm now on the fourth. You know, it's got it's got a lot of work. To do. You know, Emily Dickinson is very special to me too because my my mother used to read me Emily Dickinson poems when I was a kid. We had this book. I'm nobody. Who are you? Right. Yeah, That's what yeah. it was called. But it had these beautiful paintings in it, and she would show me the paintings and read the poems to me. So do you have that book still? Um, it's probably in storage somewhere, but I don't. I mean, you don't know it enough to go get a copy of it. No, but I mean, I'm sure it must be selected. It's poetry. called I'm Nobody. Who are you? So if you want, if, yeah. you can probably find it online. But we'll see. it's it's a great book. It has beautiful pictures. <laughs> so. Thank you, Lynn Margulis, for uh, having this discussion with me. And I just want to say it's, uh, I, personally, it's been, it's a pleasure to know you and to have you in my life. But I think also without even uh, doing anything other than what you love and what you care about, you're making a contribution to everybody's lives. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think that you're one of my favorite students. Take science, five science courses and on a trajectory toward creative writing. Without any of the prerequisites. It's very <laughs> impressive. So the feeling is mutual. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Until next time, this is the Evolution 2.0 podcast, bridging science, technology, business, and the big questions. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe on iTunes or on your preferred player. If you like the show, rate us on iTunes. Join our email list and social media at cosmicfingerprints.com. <laughs>